In today's show, we're talking about punting in fantasy basketball. What is it? Why is it? How is it? Where is it? Michael Bolton. Thanks, Josh. It's Michael Bolton here, and it's time for another episode of the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast. Let's get to it. Let's get to it, indeed. You are Locked On Fantasy Basketball, your daily fantasy basketball podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I am the lead fantasy analyst at basketballmonster.com. And you can find me on Twitter as always at redrock underscore bball on TikTok at redrock underscore bball and on Instagram at Locked On Fantasy Basketball. Thank you for making Locked On Fantasy Basketball. Your first listen every day. We are free. We are available on all platforms. Just another one here that's recorded a couple of days in advance. So if big news has happened, I'm not addressing it here because I don't know about it. Just a couple of days. That's it. We're recording this on Sunday. It's going to air on Tuesday. So there you go. Well, actually, I say another show, but now I realize that the other one that I pre-recorded actually comes out after this one. So you haven't seen that first one. I recorded them out of order. Oh, well, that's what happens. We're talking punting a discussion that is prevalent all through fantasy basketball all the time, one that is often um, misrepresented, one that is often um, misidentified, one that is often overused at times. And I'm going to talk about all of that in this show just just to get a ha- your handle on what punting actually is, how possible it is, how tough it is, how hard it is, how easy, whatever it is. You know what I mean? Michael Bolton. No, not Michael Bolton. Warning. Let's get it on, Gilly. <laughs> All right, so what is punting? What, what do I mean? First of all, if you are a player in a fantasy points league, welcome, goodbye. doesn't apply to you in the single slightest bit at all. This has got nothing to do with you. Punting is not a strategy in fantasy points leagues. It doesn't exist. It doesn't work. You can't do it. So if you are watching, it's because you like the sound of my voice, not because it's helping you in your league. This is strictly for category leagues. That is it. That's what punting is. So what is punting? It's, I've got a definition there up on the screen. It's, I'll read that out. It's intentionally neglecting one or more statistical categories to gain a stronger advantage in others. You're focusing on maximizing your team's strengths and exploiting market inefficiencies in player valuation. So from that, what we can determine is also what it isn't. Punting isn't making yourself worse. It isn't trying to gather all of the players who are bad in particular categories. It's got nothing to do with that. It doesn't matter if you have a team that hits 75% from the line or hits 77 or hits 70%. It doesn't help you at all. Losing a category by more doesn't help in the slightest. What punting is, is concentrating resources. Instead of trying to be competitive in nine categories, you're trying to be competitive in eight or seven or six whatever the case may be. So using your draft picks, your auction budget to get guys to help you in that amount of categories. So you basically need to think of it is now I am in a league that is not a nine category league, it is a six category league. How would I approach a draft in a six category league using the categories that I'm choosing here or however I'm looking at it? That's what punting is about. Don't ever be fooled into the the idea that you are in just intentionally getting worse in a category. You're not. You're intentionally getting better in others. The downside of that is usually getting worse in others. But it doesn't mean that you have to be horrendous in those categories that you punt. That doesn't mean that's what it, what it is. And punting a category doesn't mean that you avoid every player who is good in that category. That's not what it means either. We are... Again, the main one that I'll, the main takeaway that I'll give you for this is that think of your league as turning into a six category league, a seven category league, and drafting players or acquiring players or trading for players based on that new piece of information, not about being bad in a specific category. So I see it and I hear it and I see it all the time about people, well, this guy's a perfect guy to go up and get for my punt free throw strategy because he sucks at free throws. That's real. Look, and while you might be saying that and not necessarily actioning it that way, it's the wrong mindset to have. 
We're not targeting blokes who are bad free throw shooters. That's not what we're doing. We're targeting guys who help us in the remaining categories. So whether that's points or threes or assists, we target those players without any care whatsoever about what they do in free throw percentage category. So they might be an 80% free throw shooter, and that might say, well, that doesn't make sense if you're punting free throws, or what it absolutely does, if it helps you in the other categories you need. It's not about being bad. It's about being good in the other areas. And while that seems like not even any sort of distinction that needs to be talked about, it is important because you will often see people move down the path of punting or talking about it and focusing on the negatives when we're just looking at the positives. We're trying to be better versus trying to be worse. And while those two things might actually just happen at the same time, they don't have to always. That is, if you are listening to nothing more of this show outside of the first six minutes, watch the rest. But if that's all you're listening to, that is your takeaway, right? Is that you are not trying to get bad in a category or categories. You are trying to get better in the other ones. Strengthening the other ones. That is all it is. So we talked about this already. It's for category leagues and not points leagues. That is really straightforward. Now, the next question is going to be, what about head-to-head versus rotisserie? Can I only punt in a head-to-head league? No. You definitely can punt in a roto league. Is it always the most advisable strategy? No. Punting has a lot more success in a head-to-head league than it does in a roto league, but it is by no means something that needs to be 100% avoided in roto leagues. It's also not something I think that you need to 100% do in a head-to-head league. I think it increases your chances of winning but you don't need to do it. And when we're talking Roto, there are certain situations that will enable it to be um, better for you. It'll enable it to to work more for you in those those settings. So we were talking about the way that in a Roto league, you can, um, how how punting works in a Roto league. Let me throw it this way. This is a general rule that we want to look at in terms of in terms of punting and how you use it. The more teams that are in your league means that the resources, players, get spread out more thinly. It's harder to acquire high-end talent. So being strategic in who you're getting and where you're putting your resources becomes more important. So the general rule for this is for roto leagues. I'm not going to talk much about roto leagues moving forward in this show for punting. But for Roto Leagues, let's use the baseline of 12 teams, nine categories or eight categories, whatever. You choose that baseline for Roto. Anytime your teams get bigger than that, 14 teams, 16 teams, punting is more viable. 20-team Roto League, way more possible to punt because the Roto points get spread out. Instead of 12 for first place, it's 20. You've got a bigger range there and it's harder with more players spread out. The larger your roster size, punting becomes a little bit easier as well in a Roto League. Just, again, resources. The more categories you have, punting becomes more important. You run a 13-category league where you're not going to be able to be good in all 13 categories. It's, you, don't, you can't have those resources to do it. So every time an extra category is added, an extra team is at it. Oh, hey, this is also a good point. If you're in a roto league, you know you can run leagues that are odd numbers. You can have a 13-man roto league. Don't need to be even. But anytime there's a new team added, anytime there's a new category added, anytime there's a new roster spot added, the ability for punting to have success in roto increases. And the, the inverse is true. You run a seven-category, 10-man roto league, well, punting's not going to be that successful. It's going gonna, it's gonna to cost you. That is the simple rule for roto. More categories, more teams, more roster spots, more punting. And the opposite is true. Head-to-head, again, we are just trying to win our matchup. Now, whether you're playing most categories or uh, each category, doesn't really matter. Because once you get to the playoffs, everything becomes most categories anyway. And you only need to win five out of nine, six out of 11, whatever, whatever you've got in your categories. Five out of seven, four out of seven. You only need to win the majority. So concentrating your resources into winning those majority is how you get success. 
It doesn't matter. Well, oh, I just actually, I just lost two categories by a small amount. That doesn't give you anything because you need to win those other categories. So that is becomes more important towards playoffs as well. And that brings me to this next thing. We're talking about in-season draft or do you punt? Oh, sorry, in draft or in season? When do you punt? There'll be plenty of people who are like, well, I'm deciding on my punt during a draft. There'll be people who go, no, you've got to decide it after your first three picks. There will be people that say, just pick best player available. My problem with that theory is, how do you know? How do you know who the best player available is? The answer is you don't. So that that strategy always falls away for me a little bit, especially when there are you know might be 20 guys who are ranked within two steals made over a course of a season of being in a certain rank position. Like your hubris, is that the right word? Hubris to say that you know who the best player available is at that point um, will lead you to becoming unstuck because you, you just, you don't know who the best player available is. Mean, I don't know who the best player available is at that point. Nobody does because guys can change a million times. So having a little bit of strategy involved in your picks, I think makes more sense versus I'm just going to take best available and we'll figure it out. It doesn't quite work that way. So I I think that having, like, do you have to go into a draft saying, well, I'm going to punt field goals, therefore my first round pick is going to be a bad field goal guy. That's a terrible idea. I am more le- I'm more lean towards the, see what happens with your first pick and then start to adjust from there. But you don't have to, you don't have to lock yourself in. You can change the way you build your team halfway through a draft if you want. You can change how you build your team halfway through a season if you want. It's it's not that hard to do. So use each pick that you make in a draft to inform what you do with the one coming after it. But you don't have to lock yourself in at that level of, you know, we are doing this right now and nothing can change my mind. But definitely don't go in before the first round and go, well, I'm punting this, therefore I'm taking this player. That's where minus one ranks, I think, come into a lot of value because it does tell you the overall production of a player minus their worst category, not a specific punt, but how do these guys look without their worst category? And then how do we build around that? That's, I think, a good way to do it. But you can make punting decisions at any point, in draft, post-draft, in season. The key, Again, the key thing here is we are ignoring a category. We are not making a category worse. If our team is shooting 70% from the line, we are not chasing bad free throw players. We are chasing guys to help the other categories. That is a, a the key point. Today's episode is brought to you by Ibotta. Get your burgers or a hot dog for a summer barbecue. You know, you're already doing it. So why don't you go and get cash back while you're out purchasing things there for that summer barbecue? Ibotta gives you cash back on hundreds of grocery items, produce, personal care, pantry goods. So you make sure that you're beating inflation no matter what you're purchasing. You link your loyalty account or upload your receipt afterwards to Ibotta and then you get your cash back. It is that easy. Other apps will give you points and it doesn't really amount to anything, does it? With Ibotta, you get real cash back that you can cash out straight to your bank account, into your PayPal or in the form of gift cards. You can earn cash back on hundreds of online brands as well. When you start with Ibotta, including Lowe's, Macy's, Sephora, Best Buy and more. Right now, Ibotta is offering our listeners $5 just for trying Ibotta by using the code LOCKED when you register. Just go to the App Store or the Google Play Store and download the free Ibotta app and use the code LOCKED. That's I-B-O-T-T-A in the Google Play or the App Store and use the code LOCKED. Okay. Why do we bother to punt? Well, as I've mentioned many times already, we're concentrating our resources. We, if you are in a nine category league, it's really hard to be very good in all nine categories. In fact, you can be average in all nine categories, but does that get you anything? Usually no. It also gives you a level of variability insurance. And that is insulation. That is something I really do want to focus on here because as you're probably well aware, I've been doing a lot of work on the head-to-head nature of fantasy basketball because that's 95% of fantasy leagues are head-to-head leagues whether it's categories or points. And again, this doesn't apply to points, punting, but the overall idea here does. So sorry if I waved you points people away when I do have something here to talk about. Punting helps with variability insurance. There is a ton of variability on a game-to-game basis in fantasy, 
and in a week-to-week basis because that's what fantasy basketball is. There's a lot of variation. In a situation where you aren't punting, we love to look at averages. That, that's one of the things we always look at. Rankings will give you averages. Um, team stats give you averages all the time. But they don't really tell you much. They tell Not true. They tell you a lot. They don't tell you everything. Punting enables you to get a level of insulation from variability. And this is you know, the way that I, that I look at this is, is that you are in a situation where you have punted one to two categories. And that means your other six are unbelievably strong. If you want to use Z scores, you've got markers of two and a half to three in each of those categories. All right, that's how strong you are. So if one of your players gets hurt, one of your players plays fewer games, one of your players has an off week, your team is that strong in those categories that you can deal with it. It's totally okay. You have got enough strength built up that you've concentrated your resources into those six, seven, five categories that the variability doesn't impact you as much. Super important in fantasy playoffs when games played schedules might be against you or a key injury hits. Having that ability to buffer the variability, to buffer the variance in game-to-game production is one of the key things that is important in, in punting is your team might project on a weekly basis to hit 55% from the field. Your league average is 48. That means you're winning that category nearly every week. And then you lose one of your big guys, well, you might still project at 54, and you're still going to smash every team. Whereas if your team uh, your team was sitting with a projected field goals of 49 or 50, and you lose that big guy and you drop to 48, well, now you're at the vagaries of schedule and week-to-week or game-to-game variance in shooting, and that category becomes up in the air. So being able to concentrate your stats gives you insurance and insulation against injuries, schedules, and performance variability. It's one of the key things, I think, is being super strong to give you variability protection. There are a lot of myths surrounding punting in fantasy. Punting is not intentionally losing a category. It might be a byproduct of doing it, but you're not intentionally going to lose it. It doesn't benefit you a single thing. And if your mindset is, I'm trying to lose this category, you don't benefit from that. It doesn't help you in the slightest. That's not what it is. It's not what we're doing. And even the people who are staunch anti-punters, I think when you get them cornered and talk to them, they'll tell you that when they get to the fantasy playoffs, they are punting categories because they know that that is the best chance for them to win because you can't win all nine categories. So they will look at what they're doing and focus in on certain areas. That's what we're doing. We're not intentionally losing some. We're strengthening others. Some people think that punting requires you to nail your draft perfectly. Not true. It's the same as every other sort of format or every other strategy you're doing. The draft is important, but it's not make or break. You can recover from bad drafts. You can recover from mediocre drafts. You can screw up great drafts. The draft doesn't need to be perfect. There is another common thought that punting means that you can't pull off trades or it stops you making waiver moves. Bullshit. It's just bullshit. Punting, I think, actually helps trading because it enables more win-win trades to begin with. Like, you, I don't actually care about my field goal percentage, but I've got this guy who's shooting really well. Um, but I actually need to bolster my assist, but you need field goals and you you don't need assist. Let's switch them up here. We both get a win out of it. It doesn't stop you trading. And again, because part of it is the idea that if you think that punting stops you trading, that means that you think that in punting, you need to be bad in a category, which is not what it is. If you're punting free throw percentage, you know what you can do? You can actually add someone who's a good free throw shooter. You can trade for someone who's a good free throw shooter because you usually get the benefit of that guy being a pretty solid scorer and they're going to probably hit threes and they likely get you assists and they might get you some steals. And it doesn't matter if they take your overall free throws from 76 to 78%. That doesn't matter at all. But the way you value them changes because you don't care about what they're bringing to free throw percentage. So it doesn't stop you adding anybody off the wire ever. Never, ever. Don't ever have that mindset. He doesn't fit my punt build. I'm not adding him. Because unless your team is sitting there and you are punting four categories, which is really hard to do, 
but it is possible. But if you are punting like four categories and the only thing that this guy brings is in those four categories and you go, well, he doesn't actually help me. I guess you could add him if you're an active trading lead and trade him away. But there is someone who's going to bring you value no matter what the case. So don't run into this idea that punting stops you trading or stops you adding players. It is not true. The other thing is people say, well, punting means that an injury sinks you. I actually argue that's exactly the opposite. Well, what if you're punting a category, then your big guy who, let's use um, uh, let's use Giannis, as his, or let's use Luka Doncic as a free throw percentage example. All right, well, if you're punting free throws and you got Luka, well, you're rooted because, you know, how are you going to get those stats back? Yeah, I know. He's really good. If you're not punting free throws and you have Luka, you're also screwed. If you're in a non-punt build and Jason Tatum was your first pick and he gets injured, you know how you're not repl- you know how you're replacing Jason Tatum? You're not. That player doesn't exist on the waiver wire. It's not the fact that you're punting that, that stops that. It's the fact that the player's good. Oh yeah, Nick Claxton's a great punt free throw guy, but if you lose him, you, you can't you can't find that guy off the waiver wire. Well, if you had Nick Claxton and you'd worked so hard to build your team's free throws up and you lose him, you still lose his field goals, rebounds, and blocks exactly the same way. Exactly the same way. But my argument would be is that if I'm in a punting situation where I'm punting free throws, well, that means I've strengthened all my other categories. So if I do lose a mid-round rebound field goals blocks player, the fact that I've been able to strengthen those categories by diverting more resources towards it means it doesn't actually hurt me as much because I've got other guys who've built that category up. This, This idea that when you're punting a category that losing one of your key punt guys ruins you because you can't replace them it's exactly the same thing as if someone else loses that player at any other in any other sort of build. You scramble, you try and find it, but the, the idea in punting is that it actually provides you more insulation. You lose that guy, you, well, you, hopefully your team is averaging 1.2 blocks per game and losing that guy takes you to 1.1 and you're still better than 10 of the 12 teams. And then you stream blocks in. You grab the replacement. You grab Dayron Sharp. You grab the guy that comes up and helps you in that area. This idea that once you've built a team punting in a draft that you can't trade, an injury kills you, you can't use the waiver wire, is just not true. And you can't can't have that idea in your head. This is not a foolproof method, though. Not method. Well, that's not how I speak. It's not a foolproof method. Why can't I speak? A foolproof method. There you go. Because if you don't, know how to do it, you'll make mistakes. Because you'll go in there, you'll look at rankings and you'll punt a category and you'll see a guy jump up 30 spots. And you'll be sitting there and it's round two and Rudy Gobert's jump from 60 to 20 in free throw percentage. You go, okay, well, I'm my second round pick, I might as well take Rudy. Now, the idea of this is, is to try and extract excess value. So, Getting Rudy Gobert would really help in a free throw percentage punt build because he's got great field goals. Hopefully the blocks come back up. He's a good rebounder. And that helps. But when you start to take him at the perceived value of where his punt is, where you've eliminated any advantage you might get there. So it's not about reaching for the perfect target. We love to maximize value, but once you go too early, you're not maximizing anything. The other real problem in punting, and this is this can be hard to ignore, is when you miss other categories because a lot of categories are tied in together. That's just the way things work. They're tied in together. So when you punt free throws, well, let's say you punt, let's say you punt assists. Assists commonly go with points, they commonly go with threes, they commonly go with higher free throw percentage. So if you're in a situation where you're punting free throws and you're turning that on your draft tracker and you look at the value of guys, if you're not careful, you'll end up punting points and threes and maybe free throw percentage as well. You end up punting blocks. Well, there's a real chance that your rebounds and field goal percentage will sink way down as well. And you need to pay attention to that. And this again comes to the part, well, who's a, who's a center who gets field goal percentage and rebounds but no blocks? You don't need to think that way. You, you don't. And a lot of people go, well, who's, he's a perfect pump block center because he gets rebounds with field goals and no blocks. I can draft somebody who blocks 1.7 shots per game in a punt blocks build. I, I, it's fine. It's okay. Does it waste that category? A little bit. But we also understand the week-to-week variance. 
Whereas that gives me actually more of a chance of winning that one and sneaking a couple of times in that category through while still providing the strength that I need in other areas. It's all about bolstering the other categories. Bolster my rebounds. Bolster my uh, blocks. Not blocks, field goal percentage. One of the strategies, is not, not foolproof, but when you're looking in a draft and you say you're punting, let's say assists, in rounds three, four, and five, it's probably worthwhile to look at point guards. It can be worthwhile. You know, you don't, you're not targeting the value of assists, but you need to get your free throw percentage. You need to get some steals. You need to get some um, points. You need to get those. And if you just say, oh, I'm just going to load up on bigs, 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 then how do you actually fix those categories later? Because then often those bigs won't score enough and you can't get that boost later on in a draft. So it's not about in my first five picks, I must take the guys who are good in all my strong categories. Often you want to go the other direction there. You take your first one or two players and then look to boost those categories that become correlated with your punt category to help them. Otherwise, it's going to be really hard later on. And part of the idea of a punt is later in drafts, a lot more values appear to you where other people might not even consider that guy as a draftable player, Stephen Adams, but for you, he is. He might be a nice round 11 guy where you grab him and then he does give you the 1.3 blocks. He gives you 60% shooting and he gives you 10 rebounds. But you didn't get that guy in round five but you help to build up your threes or your steals in that area. So it's about making sure if you're looking at punting one category, it doesn't turn into four. Now, if you are punting four, by all means, do it. And you've got to be really focused on doing it though. Other things to talk about here with punting, I said the weekly format is really important because of that variance of games played. Now, your, guy might, your main guys might play four games, but if they've got a three-game week, that's a 25% reduction. It's a big deal. It's a big deal on a week-to-week basis. Understanding there's a level of variability here, and that brings me into this idea of soft punting, which I don't really, I don't really get the idea of this. Now I'm just going to soft punt this category. Honestly, that I, I think that there is, and I've seen a lot of people talk about it. Um, I'm not sure it's actually something that's real. To be fair, to me, that's just punting. It's like, uh, I, I'll sort of not care about this category and I'll just look to build the other ones. Yeah, exactly. That's that's the same thing. It's the same thing as punting to me. So soft or hard punting, it, it doesn't, it's the same thing, right? It, it doesn't, there's no, there's, to me, there's absolutely no differentiation in that. We are still just looking to boost our other categories. It changes a little bit in the theory of how you're building teams. But I'm also, when I say change in theory here on this screen, I'm changing my theory a little bit on punting. Whereas I think that given the week-to-week variance and statistical variance and the valuation of players being so tight through the middle and end rounds, is that not that if you aren't super hard punting a category, but if you're not super highly boosting those other categories, well, it's a pretty pointless exercise. If you end up with, let's use you know, Z scores and the green and red colorations you see on Basketball Monster or any other site, right? They're a common way to show value. If you're in a situation where you've got a really bright red because you're so negative in one category, but not many bright greens, well, that's a bad way to look at it. I would much rather have t- bright greens and maybe a small soft red. If it means I have two massive bright reds as two big negative categories, but then I've got six hugely positive ones, that's great. But I'm not looking. If I'm in a situation where things are really meek and mild in the green area and nothing's high, well, I really need to look at what I'm considering here and maybe keeping myself with a more of a balanced build that I adjust on a week-to-week basis works better. I think unless you've got really strong greens, really strong categories, having the ability, which again, gives you the ability to buffer changes in injuries and form and schedule. If you don't have that, don't bother punting. Look more for balanced and punt on a week-to-week basis based on your opponent. Because that's a lot of when people have balanced lineups. That's what they do. They punt on a week-to-week basis. Well, my opponent's got this, I'll target these categories. That's what they do which is actually a totally viable strategy as well. So unless you're going hard at being, having big positives, don't worry about where the negatives are. They can be big or they can be small. That doesn't matter. Unless you're going hard at getting the big positives, then just 
Try and even it out a little bit. Give yourself flexibility to punt each week. That's the difference in a little bit of my change in theory for this season is that unless I've got big positives in quite a few categories, I'm probably going to be more looking at week-to-week variance and adjusting that way. Multi-cat punting is hard, but if you nail it, you can be unbeatable. If you hit five categories with like combined Z-scores of fives in all of them, and your other four categories are terrible, it's almost, it is really, really tough. Now, you won't finish on top of your standings. It's really tough to lose. Often, there'll be one category, and it nearly always is steals, that is can be a little bit of a toss-up each week, but you just stream the shit out of that category to boost it up. And again, that higher proportion or higher level of production in those categories does insulate you more from injuries. I wrote pairings down here on the screen because it is something that I've told you a million times. I think is incredibly overrated and the, the focus on it is unbelievable. Like there are many ways you can go. You get a bad free throw percentage player in round one, you can either take a bad free throw percentage player in round two or you go the complete opposite way and help, hey, let's try and build my assists and points. Otherwise, I'm going to be at a real deficit coming later rounds. That's yeah, There are so many ways to do so many different strategies. It's not about here is the one way to do this one thing and being flexible like I did with my auction mock the other day. they got to be, hey, let's move around. What are we doing? Hey, how do things look here? Oh, those players are all gone. I actually need to get this category. Oh, I can't get it anymore. Maybe we need to go with two categories that we're discontinuing or discounting and pushing into six or seven. Being able to be flexible in a draft versus strictly looking at punt pairing. Now, punting does help you, give you a little bit of a change in valuation of players. And don't be afraid to reach a little bit for guys, because as I said earlier, I can't tell you who the best player available conclusively is at every pick. Nobody can. And the further you get into a draft, if you're sitting there at pick 30, well, there's probably 20 guys who are potential options at that pick. If you're picking at pick 70, well, there's probably 30 guys you can take in that area. It, you know, The uh, amount of guys that are in that spot increases. And if you take a guy that's the 90th best player available at pick 70, oh well, and it makes a little bit more sense on what you've done with your team. But each pick that you make, the decision tree sort of stuff that happens with your squad, it just branches out each time of the ways that you can go. So a focus on pairings with a set pairing strategy heading into a draft is a a really easy way to get lose your focus and to end up with a terrible draft. How can you look at what punting does? Well, we've got a few things over at Basketball Monster. There's the draft tracker where you can see in real time as you draft the values of your team, where you're good, where you're bad, how you compare to the teams that have been drafted already, how you compare to the overall pool of players, what players are left, what the scarcity of those categories are left, what you need to start targeting with your next pick because if you don't get it then, it's going to be gone. We have our team analysis, trade analysis to tell you the values of your team, where you're weak, where you're strong, what other teams' weaknesses and strengths are, so you can try and work out trades and how that benefits you as well. All that is over there at Basketball Monster. And hopefully by now, we've got the Durant ranking system up there as well. One thing that is important when talking about punting, and this calls back to a show that I did in July, I think, is correlations. Because understanding where correlations, how they work in fantasy, I think is important here. The two biggest correlations that we have in fantasy are points being negatively correlated with turnovers and assists being negatively correlated with turnovers. So in this situation, if you punt points, you almost assuredly will get to be much better in turnovers. If you punt assists, you almost assuredly will get much better in turnovers. That will just happen. So when you are targeting those categories or when you're turning punt filters on, you will see the players, when you punt points, you'll see the players with low turnovers shoot up the board. Those two things are the most highly correlated stats. But there are a few others that are important as well. The next most highly correlated is three-pointers with field goal percentage. So when you're, what's important to look at here, right? If you are punting field goal percentage, you will get a rise in your three-pointers. That is most likely what is going to happen. That is that is that is important. But what's also important to note here is that when you can see where field goal percentage ties in with like blocks down here, 
really good positive correlation. So if you're punting um, blocks, your field goal percentage will also drop. Or if you're punting field goal percentage here and you really need to start focusing on um, blocks as well, otherwise they're going to get dragged down and understanding how all these things pair together. Rebounds and field goal percentage really tightly together. And you'll notice this out of the top seven correlations, top eight correlations, points and assists versus turnovers are the biggest one, but rebounds, field goals, rebounds, blocks, blocks, and field goals. Those three categories are all very tightly correlated. Meaning when you're in a situation where you're punting one of those rebounds, field goals, or blocks, unless you're punting all three, you need to be really focused on the other two to bring them up. Otherwise, they will just drag down by necessity of or of by you potentially avoiding blocks players. Points and threes and points and assists go together really positively as well. Usually the guys that score more hit more threes. Usually the guys that score more get more assists. That's a general thing as well. So again, if you're punting assists, be really careful because your scoring might not be up to snuff. You need to get points somewhere. If you're punting threes, be careful. It might not be easy to get points. These things are tightly correlated. And this is more, it's, it's more of an important thing to look at when you're punting just to make sure those other categories don't completely fall away. Now, it is really easy to look at bigs versus smalls, but in current NBA, that's not, that's not as much of a factor because big men can pass and big men can shoot and little guys can rebound with higher rates now. But understanding how the individual stats correlate can be really key and what you need, the pitfalls you need to avoid by what's correlated so negatively. And also understand that when you're punting field goal percentage or you're punting threes, when we're talking negative correlation here, when you're punting one of those two categories, the other one there will inherently just rise. So be careful not to overvalue it because when you're taking out the high field goal percentage players, if you're drafting lower field goal percentage players, well, you're just going to get more threes as a byproduct of that. What you will notice is there are two categories that do not appear in the top eight correlations. Steals and free throw percentage. Interestingly, these are also the two categories that are are the most variable year on year. I don't know what that tells you, but it tells me something. Steals has no R squared correlation with any category that is higher than 0.5 or lower than negative 0.5 and the same with free throw percentage. What this means is that high steals players are not tied to any sort of position group. You might have, you might think that high steals go with point guards, getting your assists and threes. It doesn't really work that way. You might think that high free throws goes with those players as well, or low free throws goes with the big men. And at the moment in the NBA, it doesn't really work like that. So these are two categories that if you do isolate and punt them, steals and free throws, you're not as likely to be dragged around in peripheral categories or dragged down in peripheral categories as you are with the other six categories, other seven categories. These are a little bit more... Now, there is like a correlation for both of them at 0.47, which is... No, it's not a great correlation, but it's still there. Like if I look at rebounds and free throw percentage has a negative uh, 0.45. So it's not quite five or threes and free throws is 0.48. It's close to 0.5, but it's not quite there. Whereas everything else goes above 0.5. Steals is an interesting one. The highest correlation on steals, I believe, is assists and steals, which is a 0.48. Yeah, that's the highest correlation. So there is some ability with assists and steals to push together, but these are still the only two that uh, don't sit above 0.5 or below negative 0.5, and they are also the most variable category year on year. When we look at traditional Z-score category ranks, who are the guys that rise the most when you punt their worst category? A lot of these answers were pretty easy to know. Giannis and Tentokotomatu. You punt free throws, Giannis jumps right up. Right, he becomes one of the best players in the league. Steven Adams on free throws. Zion Williamson with free throws. I'm the biggest bird. I'm the biggest bird. Rudy Gobert with free throws. Rudy Gobert. Rudy Gobert. Lamello Ball and Fred Van Vliet with field goals and Walker Kessler and Nick Claxton with free throws. So what do you notice there? Well, they're all percentage categories. 
And why is that? Because percentage categories are treated differently to counting stats. Sometimes they can be a little bit overvalued, but the way that these are, you know, not just building numbers on, because you could have a guy shoot one time and you still can be uh, competitive in that category because they're ratio categories. Therefore, they have more of a downside, but they can be a higher upside as well. And then we get into the complications with how the Z scores uh, materialize that lead you to these problems. But these are very common punting categories because the perceived increased value from the players is highest. And I agree with that. That is the biggest increase that you can get by, by punting these categories. It's really hard also to be strong in, in both categories. It's not impossible. The field goal percentage, free throw percentage correlation is negative 0.4. So there is some correlation, but it's not super strong. The guys who suffer the biggest falls in ranking, and that's not because they become worse, it's because other guys behind them become better. These are the guys who are sort of just mid across the board. A lot of the names you will understand, and it's no surprise who the top guy is. Um, I think I am a TH. T to the H. Yeah, TH for life. Harris's worst categories are steals and blocks, and he's not terrible at it. He's not great, but he doesn't gain any big value like many other players do. Shaden Sharp is also someone that falls in a minus one sort of setting, like taking away a worst category. I think field goal percentage for him is going to be rough, but it's not going to be as bad as others. Jeremy Sohan's free throws are his worst category, but in a punt setting, it drops him a little bit. Obi Toppin's assists aren't particularly strong. Keldon Johnson's free throws, they're not great, but he doesn't actually rise in a punt free throw or in a, in a punt. Uh, he, he does rise in a punt free throw, sorry. In a minus one setting, he doesn't rise that much. Brandon Miller's points is probably his worst category, but I think he's going to be sort of average across the board. And Pascal Siakam, his worst category is blocks, but when you're looking at a minus one sort of setting, he doesn't take a big step forward. In fact, he takes a step backwards of about 12 to 15 spots because other guys are jumping forward ahead of him. Let's look at the projected first round based on Yahoo ADPs and look at those players' worst categories. At number one is Nikola Jokic. His worst categories is three-pointers. At number two is Joel Embiid. His worst category is three-pointers. So when you're drafting these guys, you know, punting threes is absolutely a, a possibility here, especially understanding that you can discount threes a little bit through the draft. If you get bad at it, that's fine. But also understand that you can get threes everywhere off the wire. They're all, they're all over the place. Plenty of guys that hit two threes a game on the waiver wire. Luka Doncic is three on ADP at the moment. His worst category is free throw percentage. You can be competitive in free throw percentage with Luka very easily but it's also his worst category. Jason Tatum is fourth on ADP. Field goal percentage is his worst category. Torres Halliburton at five has rebounds as his worst. And Shea Gildas Alexander is at six with three-pointers as his worst category. Shea's an interesting one because he's a guard. So he's getting a lot of guard stats, but he's not hitting threes. So you can find those threes in other areas, but he also helps you to you know, bring in some other sort of... He's a little bit different to your traditional guard given his high field goals, his good block rate, solid rebound numbers. The end of the first round, Steph Curry, worst category is blocks. Lillard's worst is field goal percentage. Durant's is steals and always has been. LaMelo Ball, field goal percentage. Anthony Davis's worst category is threes. And Kyrie Irving's worst category is rebounds. And I've got an asterisk there next to Kyrie. Why? Can you guess why? Yeah. If you guessed it, Congratulations. But Kyrie Irving has the smallest negative of any player in Yahoo's top 12. The common idea is, well, I'm going to take Jason Tatum because he's just balanced across the board. He never gets hurt and I don't have to punt with him. Well, Kyrie doesn't have the hurt problem. Well, he has the hurt problem, but Kyrie Irving is actually a little bit more balanced than Jason Tatum, according to how I project things out. The negative you get from Tatum's field goal percentage is larger than than the negative you get from Irving's rebounds. I didn't expect that to be the case. I thought for sure that number would be Tatum, but it's not. It's Irving. Irving has the smallest negative number in um, in the first round out of everyone's worst category. Again, a little bit of a surprise to me. The other one that was close there, yeah, look, it's not a big difference between the two, but the other one there is, well, actually it's not. No, those two are pretty clearly the, the top two there. I thought that was an interesting thing to discover that Kyrie had the smallest negative out of everybody in that first round. Play around with punting. 
play around with it on Draft Tracker or on Basketball Monster. Play around with it in mock drafts. Understand that when you do it and look at your team at the end, you go, oh, I actually ended up punting three categories and I didn't want to. And I didn't actually get strong enough in those other ones. Be deliberate with what you're doing. Also understand if you're not being deliberately strong in some areas, maybe don't do it. And look to punt on a week-to-week basis. Punting still, to me, is very much the key to success in fantasy basketball. Whether you build your team to do it the same every week, or you structure your team to punt specifically each week, however you want to approach that. And a lot of that is how you've attempted to attack the draft and how you've attacked free agency and all that sort of stuff. But winning six or seven categories or five categories a week is how you win fantasy. And you can do that by setting up huge strengths or outmaneuvering your opponent each week to get those huge strengths. I think we can all we can all agree that being the best team in all nine categories is impossible. I hope this was able to help you somewhat just in terms of giving you a brief overview of punting, talking about what it is, what it isn't, how it works, how you can uh, take advantage of it, what you don't need to do, and dispelling some misconceptions and providing a little bit of insight into some of the players who are big gainers there. Don't hyper-focus on it. So much hyper-focus gets put on pairing and punting, and that's, again, I keep leaning more and more towards the way that you are getting to win fantasy is by just finding the real big value breakout guys a lot of the time and being smart with finding that on the waiver wire. Punting reduces variability, but it's not the be-all and end-all. Follow this podcast, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and on the Odyssey app. And if you're here on YouTube, thumb it up and leave your comments down below. Guys, we are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya. That's the wrong number.